Hi guys and welcome to History Infection. This time we're talking about prion or prion diseases. A lot of diseases have quite small effects that can have quite dramatic outcomes, but a lot of these tend to be the body's own immune response trying to combat the infectious agent. One does stick out of my mind which is caused by one of the smallest things you can have in your body, a protein, but it causes such drastic physiological damage to the brain. These are prion diseases. Now this might not sound too shocking, but on the list of possible infectious agents and possible causative agents of infection, proteins are probably quite low on the list. Prion proteins set in a couple of their own categories as being an infectious agent which has no genetic information. They are also one of the few infectious agents that can also be an inheritable genetic disease. The prion protein is found throughout your body and mine. It's naturally occurring protein. So should you be worried? Well, as I said, I have it in my body and I'm not that worried. Well, the honest answer is actually maybe. If you lived in the UK around 1989 and ate beef products, then there's a chance that you ingested infectious prion protein material. I wasn't living in the UK at this time, nor have I gone any sort of cannibalistic ritual, so there's a chance I haven't ingested any prion material from any other source apart from the ones inside my own body. The protein only really becomes infectious when it has a certain physical structure. Proteins can be highly complex 3D structures. Enzymes which are generally made out of proteins require this spatial structure to have the activity that they do. So we have this naturally occurring prion protein in our bodies, which in one form is fine, but in the other can be quite dangerous. And you probably have the other in your body at the moment, but it's a balance between these two proteins that can lead to a disease state. If one balance gets tipped one way, you can develop a prion disease. The discovery of prion diseases began in the 1960s when two biologists were trying to identify the causative agent behind Kuru and CJD, or Kreuzfeld Jakobs disease as its full name. They tried to destroy the causative agents of these diseases by radiating them with ionizing radiation, which would destroy anything around the size of a virus and larger. However, when they tested the samples, they found they were still infectious, and this meant obviously that the causative agent they were dealing with was smaller than a virus. They suggested that the causative agent might be a protein, and they had an early proponent of their work in the form of Crick, of Watson and Crick fame, who identified the structure, along with help of quite a few other people, of DNA. He even included the idea in his central dogma of molecular biology. The idea caused quite a bit of upset as it seemed to go against the DNA protein hypothesis of genetic information. It was unclear how an infectious agent might work if it didn't contain any genetic information. It might be able to cause a disease state in one person, but how would this then go and actually infect someone else who didn't have the disease? The protein responsible was isolated in 1984 and led to the Nobel Prize in 1997. It was also given the name prion protein. Prion proteins have been given another Nobel Prize in 1976 for the work of Daniel Gajewski, whose name I've probably mispronounced. However, doesn't matter. He passed into infamacy due to his widespread sexual molestation of children. As I mentioned, the prion protein is naturally occurring in us and animals. This suggests that it has some strongly conserved function within the body, although researchers aren't too sure what this function really is yet. Yet. Among the first diseases to be recognised and later attributed to prion proteins was scrapie in sheep. Scrapie is a neurological condition in sheep which leads to them, as the name suggests, scraping themselves. They tend to rub themselves raw against posts with their legs and whatever else they can find in the field. Scrapie is important to humans as by a chain of event it led to infectious prion material entering the human food chain via cattle. Around 1989, cattle in the UK were fed meat and bone meal food, which contained recycled parts of animals such as sheep. It suggested that this is how the prion protein, the infectious version, got into the human food chain via cattle. Cattle would eat this infectious material and then we would eat the cattle. This led to new variant CJD. So how is the prion protein actually infectious? Well, it has a neat little trick. It can change the shape of other healthy prion proteins into the infectious form. This means it can sort of start off a chain reaction of changing one protein into infectious structure, which will then go along and change another prion protein into the infectious structure too. Incidentally, the prion protein in its infectious form is also highly resistant to degradation by enzymes and by temperature, meaning it's quite hard to destroy. So if it gets in, it's likely to stick around. Diseases caused by prion proteins in humans have several names, such as Kreuzfeld Jakobs disease, Kuru, and fatal familiar insomnia. These are all caused by the infectious agent of the prion protein. Some are actually genetically inherited, while others are infectiously given to people. Kuru was a neurological condition that existed in certain cannibalistic tribes called the Foro tribe in Papua New Guinea. The word Kuru in the Foro language means to shake, or as we call it medically, ataxia. It was also sometimes called the laughing sickness, as this is another neurological condition caused by the prion protein. 
Cure was only really indicated in women and children of both genders. It seemed to skip adult males, which confused researchers of the disease quite a bit. Researchers got a bit of a clue when they found that women and young children were taking part in cannibalistic rituals involving brain material. Young boys above the age of 7 or 8 no longer took part in the ritual. The ritual included eating the brain material and actually spreading it on the face as well. Hence, only women and young children were ones exposed to the infectious prion protein. The prion protein leads to the degradation of brain tissue. As this picture shows, large holes begin to appear in the infected person's brain. This obviously leads to a disease state progressing. Currently, there's no real agreed treatment or cure for prion diseases. As of 2009, new variant CJD, which was caused by the introduction of prion proteins into the food chain has killed 176 people in the UK and 44 other people confirmed worldwide. I should mention that most cases of prion diseases arise sporadically and this tends to be due to some sort of genetic susceptibility to the person to develop it as a genetic condition and not as an infectious agent condition. However, there's at least one more twist to this tale. People who are genetically susceptible to develop sporadic CJD are also more likely to develop it quicker if they come across an infectious material, such as those who ate it in a food chain. All the people who developed new variant CJD had the same genetic susceptibility. They all had the same code on at the 129th position. This means that there is a proportion of the population who are still likely to develop prion diseases, but due to their genetic resistance, have a delayed progression from infection to disease state. However, this idea hasn't yet been proven. There have been a few animal studies showing positive results for it, and we do know that in the case of the genetic inheritance, people who have the homozygote form for susceptibility and those who have the homozygote form for resistance do show different times of incubation. This means that there might be a significant number of the population who will go on to develop a prion disease in some years to come due to the introduction of infectious prion proteins into the foodstock in 1989. However, until that happens, we really can't say for sure if it will follow the same progression as the genetic version and some of the animal model studies that we have. So that's a short history of prion diseases. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, try not to panic too much. Feel free to subscribe and like if you have enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be talking about a short history of measles. Thanks for watching.